Low, low. I'm going to try and adjust a little bit here. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I have an external mic here, so I'm making sure. It looks like it's working out fine, though. Hello. Sorry about the bright light in the back. I'm going to try and adjust briefly before I get started. You can see some of my jelly tanks in the back. All right. Fantastic. Okay. Well, I think I'll go ahead and get started. So hello. Uh, my name is Anna Klompen. I'm a PhD student at the University of Kansas. And this is the Earth Live Lesson Series. And I'm going to be talking about some of my work on jellyfish uh, and specifically studying venoms in this one species of hydroid that I'm pretty excited to tell everyone about. So in case you're not familiar where Kansas is, if you look at a map of the United States and you put your finger as about dead center as you can, uh, that's about where I am. So not really any water anywhere around. So you might wonder how it is that we study jellyfish here in Kansas and that's by having live animals. So in our lab, we have about seven different species. Like I said, I mostly work on one. I don't have that species here today, but I do have a few others here. I'm gonna do my best for you to hopefully see. Now this is a species you might be familiar with. It's in a lot of aquariums. So these are, we're trying to get it back up here. These are moon jellyfish. These are very young moon jellyfish. They're just a few weeks old. You can see them pulsing around here. Now these are the ones with a four leaf clover, cute little four leaf clover in the middle, pulsing about. And then the other, uh, whoops, then I move over here. These are Ephyra. So these are really small jelly. So these are probably only about a day old. And this species is called Sandaria malinensis. It's related to sea nettles. So these jellies are gonna get eventually the bell will probably be about this big. And the tentacles could be about this long. Um, but for right now, they're just very tiny and cute. And you can see they don't really have full tentacles yet. They do have a mouth. Um, so we'll probably start feeding them soon and trying to raise them and see how big we can get them. Awesome. So I got into studying jellyfish uh, pretty young. I got pretty obsessed with the idea of studying jellyfish. So I knew I wanted to be a scientist. And really what kind of drove me was the thought that there are these things out in the world that we do not understand and we do not even know about, but they're happening right now at this time. And just thinking about the idea of not really discovering because they're happening already, right? But, but describing these things um, that are occurring right now and why they might be happening. That was always very exciting for me. I was also pretty driven to look at the ocean pretty early. Um, something about the ocean just drew me, uh, especially it's like a bunch of the weird creatures that you find within it. And I was really drawn to deep ocean. And so when I started looking at books and the internet and everything about the deep ocean, started reading a lot about jellies. And most of what I was reading was kind of the same things over and over. And slowly I learned it's because we don't know that much about jellyfish on these really beautiful creatures that I think are pretty charismatic. Um, so going through that, then that's kind of what I stuck to. And then I learned about venoms as well as I was going through high school probably and how cool venoms were. And when I started looking at jellyfish venoms, because that's something we all probably know, right? Jellyfish are capable of stinging you, or at least some are. Turns out we didn't know much about that either. So that's really kind of what headed me in that direction was the thought of describing this thing that seems very, very obvious, but we really don't know all that much about, at least in the scientific world. So I'm very briefly gonna talk about uh, first jellies and this kind of group that I'm working on. A little bit about venoms and then I'll talk about exactly what it is that I work on for my PhD work. And then there'll be time for questions in the end too. So I'm just gonna look at the um, chat as much as I can to answer them in there too. So the, I see one question now, so I'll answer that. So no, they don't have brains, not true brains, at least not something like ours, which is an organ. Uh, it, and for most animals, it's this organ that's helping control a lot of these other systems. They don't have any organs, um, so they have no need for a brain like that, but they do have kind of a brain-like um, network. Uh, around their body. So it's called a, set it's a decentralized nervous system. 
nerve net is the name of it. And so they are capable of sensing things, um, but probably not processing in the same way we do. That's a good question, but no, they do not have brains. Some do have eyes though. So we might get to that at the end. So if someone is curious about jellyfish eyes, I know someone that you can talk to. So if you're interested, uh, someone tweet me on Twitter and I can point you that person. So jellyfish are part of this larger group called cnidarians or nettle bearing animals. And cnidarians are split into three larger categories. So one is the anthozoans. Anthozoans are your sea anemones and corals. Those, that's not really the group I work on, but there's about 7,000 species. There is a lot of work done on those two. In terms of cnidarian research, a lot of the focus is on anthozoans. There's another group called endonidozoans. These are parasitic jellyfish. There's about 2,000 species in this group. We do a little bit of that work in my lab too. We look at these parasitic jellyfish. But the group I really hone in are called medusazoans. There's about 4,000 species in total. Medusa, if you've heard of that. Um, so you might be thinking of uh, kind of the snakes on the head woman too. But Medusa is referring to something uh, pretty specific, a specific stage. So I'm going to try, we're going to see if I can get drawing up in here. So Medusa, very simply, fell a bunch of tentacles. So this stage here, uh, we would call a Medusa, a lot, a lot of people call it the jellyfish stage. So Medusazoans are, in, are uh, cnidarians that either have a jellyfish stage or at one point probably had a jellyfish or jellyfish-like stage. So you might be saying, so jellyfish is just one stage of the life cycle. What's the other stage? So um, if you've ever looked at coral polyps uh, or like what the actual corals look like, or, um, a polyp is the other stage and that's kind of the first stage that they, um, or one of the first stages that a jellyfish would go through. And if you think about a jellyfish, a polyp essentially flipped upside down and has an attachment to the bottom. So they're usually very small, they're attached to the bottom and they don't swim around. They can reproduce asexually at this stage. At a, at a Medusa stage, they produce sexually. So there's males and females very often. So I have uh, some polyps here, and this is actually when you're studying jellyfish or working with jellyfish, this is a really the easiest stage to work on. So this, they're kind of floating around a little bit. They haven't attached to the bottom quite yet. But these are some of those sea nettle polyps that I talked about before. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get it so you can kind of see. They're pretty hard to see here, um, but I do have some pictures of different polyps on my Instagram as well, and on Twitter, I put these on here. So these are called polyps. So I will say, so when I'm saying the term jellyfish, I'm usually referring to that stage, right? Or a Medusa zone in particular, but there is um, some confusion a lot of the time because Jellyfish uh, is really a catch-all term for a lot of things. So I put a video in the description. It's called There's No Such Thing as a Jellyfish. It's narrated by a jellyfish researcher at Ambari. I really highly recommend looking at that because that kind of clears up some of these things. Uh, and it's just a cool video with a lot of great pictures. So like I said, all uh, so we, I knew that, and most people know that jellyfish sting, cnidarians can sting. They all possess these stinging cells. Um, that are used to inject venom. So when you're getting, if you get stung by a jellyfish or if a jellyfish is stinging prey, what's happening is these teeny tiny cells, smaller than the width, the width, hundreds, maybe thousands of them are curled up. And then when they make contact uh, with a predator or prey or accidentally you, they fire these stinging cells, these threads full of venom, shoot five million Gs of force, and the fastest uh, biological reaction that we currently know of. Some can fire as fast as 700 nanoseconds, I believe. Extremely fast and very powerful, but very small and very small amounts of venom. Now all cnidarians, like I said, so all, all this group can sting, but not all of them can sting you. And actually of the many thousands of species, very few can actually sting people. Those are just often some of the ones that we know the most about because they are capable of stinging people. And because of that, the research into jellyfish venoms is really focused in on these medically relevant jellyfish species. So things like box jellyfish. The Australian box jellyfish is one of the most deadly animals on the planet in terms of its venom. It doesn't, it doesn't actually hurt the most people. That would probably be closer. That would definitely be snakes, probably scorpions and some other animals. But their venom is really, really powerful. 
There's also Irukandji jellyfish. This is a couple different species that cause something called Irukandji syndrome. Would also recommend looking that up. That's a really serious set of symptoms that comes from a jellyfish sting. But again, the focus is really on these medically relevant species, whereas for the vast majority, jellyfish species are either very small, very cryptic, and we really don't know much about them. So because of that, when studying venoms, unlike really with studying snakes uh, or spiders, or now cone snails, which uh, also are studied in terms of their venom, we don't really have a good way of looking for what jellyfish venoms look like, because they look pretty different. So let me talk about venoms really quick too. Venoms are these complex mixtures of toxins, can be tens to hundreds of different toxins that are deployed by an animal. So intentionally deployed through a specialized system, fang, stinger, stinging cells, into another animal for a very specific purpose. Often this can be predation. So they're trying to eat that animal. It could be defense. There's a few other uh, kind of cool things venom can do too. So venom might also be used to uh, compete with other uh, other individuals of the same species. So that's what male platypi do. So platypus, um, platypuses are venomous, but only the males, and they really only use it to fight each other. So that's a really weird use of venom. But, all, but always it's really this intentional thing that's happening and it must be injected. So in studying venoms, you could study the behavior, you could study the venom system, you could study what the venom looks like, and there's a few ways to do that. You could look at the proteins that make it up. You, you could look at the genome of the animal, so all the DNA, and look at find certain toxin genes. You can do the same thing when you're doing something called transcriptomics, and that's really kind of where I work too. Transcriptomics is not looking at the whole genome. So you might, the whole genome is kind of all the instructions, everything about you. Transcriptome is only showing really the parts of the genome the genes that are being expressed in a very specific place at a very specific time. So for us, like a human genome, if we took a transcriptome of our head, took it of uh, like skin or took it of any of our different organs, the transcriptome would be very, very different because only a certain number of genes are being expressed in each of those areas. And that's how we kind of kind of learn about the difference in each of these areas, about what each thing is doing based on the genes being expressed. So I do a similar thing with jellyfish. So now I'm gonna talk about the species that I work on and I'm very excited about this because this is such a weird species that I had no idea about when I came into grad school. And I think it's just awesome. And it's perfect, really a great animal for studying venoms, um, which again are really hard to study in most other uh, jellyfish species. So this animal is called Hydractinia symbiologicarpus, long name. We also call them snail fur. Uh, and the reason for our snail fur hydroids, and the reason is these hydroids, at least for mine, live on hermit crabs and they live on hermit crab shells. And the specific species, so there's a couple different kinds of hydractinia. The one I work on only lives on one species of hermit crab on the east coast of the US and it only grows on the shells. That's awesome. So this, uh, on the hermit crab, so all these little fuzzy bits, those are all little tiny polyps. But this whole thing here is a colony. So these are colonial uh, animals. So that means each of the individuals in here, individuals, actually have the same genotype. They actually asexually reproduce from each other. So this is all just one organism, but different individuals. It's really a kind of a cool uh, process in terms of what, what is an individual in this case. But this is one organism here. So because they're a colonial animal, uh, what we can do is actually our animals in the lab are all one genotype, but we split them in a bunch of different ways and are growing them in a bunch of different tanks. But again, it's just one genotype, which is cool. So hydroctinia gets even cooler in my case, at least for studying for venoms. So I'm gonna try and draw this out. So I have some pictures on my Instagram of this, but they have something called a division of labor. So what that means is in this colony, you have some polyps that look like pretty standard polyps. So again, that stalk with the tentacle sticking up, have a little mouth, but they have several other polyp types that again are the same genotype, 
but they do very different things. Uh, they have a very specific task. So I'm just going to try and draw no guarantees about this. So if this is kind of the, whew. so this is the feeding polyp and this is what a good bit of the colony looks like. So they, it has tentacles like normal and it has a mouth to feed with. Now this is called a gastrozoid. There's also gonozoids. So they look like little Christmas trees to me. So they have these cute little tops full of stinging cells. And then they have these huge spots. They have no mouth. So uh, colonies can either be male or female. So this is either uh, large uh, eggs in here or there's sperm in here. They do not eat, they do not have a mouth. Their stinging cells up here really are probably only used for defense. And that's their role in the colony. There's another polyp type that looks kind of like a giant tentacle, but it has the same kind of puff ball of stinging cells on the top. This is, this is called a dactylozoid. It only captures food, no mouth again. And in the hermit crab, it only grows at the aperture of the shell. So where the crab is, and it will steal food from the hermit crab and then unwind and hand food to the gastrozoids. Super cool. It's so fun to watch. On my Twitter, I'll post a video of what I call dactylozoid dancing. And it's just a bunch of these dactylozoids on a shell waving around because they also will somewhat be defensive. They don't want things to get onto the colony. There's one other really rare polyp type and it actually looks really just like a big tentacle. This is a, called a tentaculozoid. It has large stinging cells all over and it only appears when other things uh, uh, happen to be on the shell. So like algae or potentially other kinds of jellyfish and it actually attacks them. So it will attack like little algae or, or other, other kind of critters that are trying to get hermit crab shell too stings the crap out of them, and then gets reabsorbed back into the colony. So all of these animals, which there could be hundreds or thousands, are connected by feeding tubes. So what happens is when the, these gastrozoids get food, they basically pass it down into these columns, and then they pass it on to the whole rest of the colony to feed them. Super, super cool. So the huge benefit of this animal, so like I said, venoms are injected for a very specific purpose. Now in terms of a lot of other animals like uh, snakes and scorpions and cone snails uh, and spiders and insects, all these different venomous animals, it's, you can watch their behavior and you can see why it is that they're doing, uh, why they're stinging something. So they might be doing it defensively. They might be trying to capture a certain prey item you can watch their behavior and get a good sense of what their venom is being used for. Now there's venom can be used for multiple different purposes too. And there's actually some, uh, there's really good evidence that animals will change their venoms over time, depending on what they're using it for. So snakes. Uh, and I believe some, I believe some spiders as well have been shown like as they grow up, their diet changes from when they're young to old, their venom will change too, to kind of correspond to that new kind of food. Jellyfish, it's really, really difficult to get some sort of behavior out of these. It's really hard to study um, polyps in the wild, too. They're really hard to find. So in that case, we're not totally sure what their venom is really used for. We know they have it, but what it is specifically for defense, uh, prey capture. Sometimes things get confused in venoms as digestive enzymes, too. There's no way to really parse this out. But with hydroctinia, it's basically parsed it out for me. I can figure out what venoms are used in prey capture, what are used a bit for prey capture, but might just be digestive enzymes, and then what are used for defense. And I do it by doing that transcriptomics uh, work that I talked about earlier. So I have essentially genes that I know are very specific to each of these three polyp types. We don't have it for this one, because again, they're very rare. And I've looked at the venoms between these three. And their venoms are very different between these three types in the same animal, same genotype. And they roughly correspond to what we'd expect. There's some pretty powerful, at least they seem to be, or potent toxins in the prey capture polyp, but there's not that many toxins. There's a lot in these, 
which are doing two functions, right? And then in these, we don't see the same kind of toxins as we see in the two prey capture polyps. It's likely that then those toxins are being used for defense, for defending, um, for defending the eggs or the kind of sperm packets here. Super cool. So that's what I'm working on in my PhD, and I'm doing that in a couple of, uh, other ways as well, um, but really focusing on transcriptomics. And then eventually what we're going to do as well is maybe see if we can actually do something, uh, some gene manipulation stuff. So actually try and go into the animal and knock out certain genes and see if that uh, changes how the animal behaves. So are they able or not able to capture prey that we, they once were able to at one point? All right, so I'm getting kind of at the end of time. I can ramble about these for, for so long. I really love these. So I'm going to get to some of the questions. Um, I do want to just plug very quickly, so I'm not affiliated with either of these books, but I do want to show. So I really got started uh, I, um, reading a lot of books just on marine biology. This book got me interested. Just, here's some books if you have someone that's maybe interested. So this book it's probably backwards, it's called Jellyfish, and it's by Lisa Ann Gershwin, Dr. Lisa Ann Gershwin. She's a jellyfish biologist, has um, described a ton of species, and this has just such good info and beautiful pictures. Recommend that. The other one that I think just came out recently is the Smithsonian's Oceanography. This also just has a ton of beautiful images, and there's a lot of good stuff, very up to date on uh, jellyfish as well, amongst many other things. So those are the two things that I wanna say there. All right, so I'm gonna go through a few of the questions and um, I'll try and just go for another three, maybe four minutes. Um, I do wanna say my Twitter and Instagram uh, are on the bottom, so it's at gelatinous sting. And if you have any questions at any point, I love talking about jellyfish or venoms or answering those. So please feel free and if you, um, I think there's a couple of threads with this event. If you put your question in there, I'll try to get to that too um, when I can. Awesome. All right. So uh, big one on here. So uh, can jellyfish be found in all seas, oceans, and waters around the world? Yes. They're in every marine system. Deep ocean, where you might see like this firework jelly or these deep sea siphonophores, all the way up to the, through the coast, like these coral reefs and all the, uh, kind of every marine system on the planet. There are freshwater jellyfish too. So we have some in our lab. Um, they're originally from China and because they're so good at surviving, they've actually been uh, invasive. And I believe there's many of these freshwater jellyfish called Craspedacusta in Europe and they're in almost all of the continental United States as well. We have some of those. They don't really seem to cause too many problems, at least that we can think of. But yes, they're everywhere. How are jellyfish coping with climate change? That's a, that's a really interesting and ongoing question, and it's not super clear. So it was thought for a while that jellyfish might be kind of like the cockroaches of the ocean, that they could survive really anything because they've been around a long time. Over 550 million years, twice as long as the dinosaurs were even around. They've been around for a long time, and they seem to be fairly adaptable uh, to the pollution, um, higher acidity, kind of all these changes that are happening. And they're not fished, generally. They're not overfished, and so there's not as much human, there's not as much impact in that way. Um, but it's, it seems to be kind of variable um, for certain species. So a lot of what we know is biased to a certain set of species that we have pretty decent data on but we don't have a lot of data on most in terms of their global populations for the vast majority of jellyfish. And some jellies are really getting hit hard, it looks like as well. So it's still kind of, it's still being studied. Um, I know several people are, are looking into this right now, these kind of global patterns. Um, so another thing in the, in the description too, there's a jellyfish watch and um, there's another jellyfish kind of citizen science, community science work where if you spot a jellyfish when you're out and about and you take a picture and you upload it, um, this helps scientists right now try and understand those patterns. So you can be very helpful to that sort of question later. Um, so why do they, why do they photosynthesize or do they not get any nutrients from that? So photos, so only some jellyfish have these algal symbionts. Um, and they tend to, they actually still need to eat. So they don't get all the energy that they need to survive just from their algal symbionts. But it seems to be just this, um, 
this is also something being studied, and this is uh, studied in corals and whatnot as well that also have algal symbionts. Uh, it's not really clear, I think, exactly how it is that that relationship started, um, but uh, they do still need to eat. They can't just get all of their energy from sunlight. That might vary from species to species, though. Um... I once read there's a species of jellyfish that's technically immortal. All right, so I think that'll be um, my last one. There's a few others in here, but I, I'm going to get to them either in the chat at some point later, um, I promise, because I know there's a few more. So, yes, um, it's called the immortal jellyfish. It's a uh, close, kind of close to the species that I study. So what happens is, is the little polyp will make a jellyfish, and if that jellyfish is injured or starving, but not um, lethally so, it'll take all of its cells, revert them back into essentially stem cells, and then rebuild the polyp. And it could do this kind of over and over again. So that makes it somewhat biologically immortal. But that's not unique just to that species or that kind of set of species. Actually, moon jellyfish, um, these ones I showed here, there's some uh, anecdotal evidence, I believe, that these actually can do the same thing. So if a moon jellyfish dies in a tank and you leave it for months on end, uh, it might actually, from the remains, form a new polyp. That should be the same as the species that, um, as the, not the species, sorry, the medusa that tied in there. So this is a strained process, and that's also still being studied in some way. But yes, it's called the immortal, uh, the nickname for it is the immortal jellyfish. All right, I think I'm hitting the end of, um, end of my time here. Uh, but I will try and get back into the chat for some of these. Um, thank you all for tuning in, too. I really appreciate it. Um, so the last thing I want to say is that there will be another Earth Live lesson next week as well. Um, so tune in for that. But I think for now, um, please come talk to me on social media about these. Uh, and uh, you can also see also on my Instagram a lot of the other cool jellyfish that I've gotten to work with in my time as a grad student. So thank you so much. Um, and I hope everyone has a good rest of your day.